Beyond Euclid's plain, a star multiplies. Us. We are two triangles meeting at a star. A third invisible, felt. Wordless, divine, guiltless. The star does not ask. Is. Body, word, soul, unite, kiss, breathe, not with desire, but devotion, gratitude, infinite space to swell, to fill, to condense into air, into vapor, horizon, to calm, to inspire. The sea asks nothing, be, the star, the kiss, the union. Trinity field of two triangles meeting at a prayer are us. Yo, from the Kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where oration and invocation spark the spirit of the imagination. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging. This time around, we welcome into the house Miss Katie Bohintz. Katie is the author of Trinity Star Trinity, a long poem dedicated to the divine feminine recently released by the fine folks over at Scarlet Imprint. Katie is a poet and data scientist, an avant-garde publisher and a professional marketer, an activist, an astrologer, and an innovator. She studied pure math in comparative literature, and in her words, she doesn't think these things are contradictory, she thinks it's the future. As for Trinity Star Trinity, this was written after experiences Katie had in the home of Greek lyrical poet Sappho and at the birthplace of the Greek Olympian Hera. The long poem takes shape as an ode or chant and is comprised of 27 poems of 27 words each, and speaks to Katie's interest in astrology, triangles, and mathematics. Katie did join me via cell phone, and the audio was a bit problematic at times, but the message comes through loud and clear in the end, so stick with it because we did some thinking, we did some questioning, and we did a whole lot of laughing. Enjoy! Katie Bohens, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. No, no, no. The pleasure is all mine, believe me. So you have recently released some poetry through Scarlet Imprint. What a, a great publisher they are. I know some of our listeners are familiar with them. And the book is called Trinity Star Trinity. But before we dig into that, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, who is Katie Bohens and how did she come to be not only writing poetry, but interested in it as an art form to begin with? Oh, wow. Good question. So... Geez, my my bio, it's, uh, I am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. When I was growing up, you know, I have the pleasure of coming from, all things considered, a, a very nice family. But my father did international business, and I, I just wanted to go travel, and I wanted to get out, get the fuck out of Cleveland, basically. So I, I fell into a scholarship and did my, my senior year of high school in France through a little program where there was an American school and I studied languages there, which was amazing as someone who was really kind of obsessed with language and the entries into cultural knowledge that language gives you. And I fell in love with traveling. And so I, you know, I was in college. I, I went to Georgetown, also very fortunate to go there on a scholarship. And I was there for about two years and I thought, this is great, but I went over in Mandarin and I dropped out of school and, and went to Beijing and to learn Mandarin. And part of the secret design of this that I didn't tell anybody was also that I thought that if I was in Beijing that I could I would have time away from everyone that I knew to, to write. And I would test myself and see if I was a real writer. Well, 
when I went to Beijing, I wrote some here or there, and I studied Mandarin. It was great. And, but what I ended up getting involved in was um, I ended up getting involved in a human rights group. <laughs> That's joy. <right>. Wow. <laughs> very close to my heart, and I was very passionate about it, but I got so deeply involved in it that I uh, almost completely forgot about everything else. I mean, it was completely consuming. And I got so involved in it that I, and, you know, also I think you could say a little traumatized by it, but, you know, it's not easy work in China to do human rights work. The, you know, the government's persecuting you and there's danger and people around you are in very real danger. So anyway, so I came back to the States and the funny thing was I was very, sort of like very emotionally closed off, but I was, I was very determined. I went back to school. I was like in the library all the time. I was just studying and I went to, as part of my studies, I went to uh, literally a literary conference because I was majoring in comparative literature and math. And the comparative literature let me keep up with all my languages. I was doing French and Mandarin, and, and I was doing math. And I and I went to this literary conference, and I met this guy who was actually kind of inappropriately hitting on me as I was kind of a young student <laughs> at the time. Yeah, I think that happens um, in college sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens. And, um, you know, he looked at me and he said, you're a writer. And I, I was like, no, I'm not. And he said he wouldn't let it go. And sort of like throughout the day, he said it to me a couple of times. And it sort of woke something up in me that I had forgotten about. And I just started writing all the time. And I mean, all the time. I mean, waking up at four o'clock in the morning to write things down, waking up at, at all anywhere I was, I would just drop everything in order to write. And over the next extended, I, I mean, that was, let's say, 2006. And I I just wrote all the fucking time. And I mean, just all, <laughs> like, all the time. And um, a lot of bad poems, a lot of things I threw away, a lot of things I saved. And a lot of what I wrote from then until about 2013 is actually now... Uh, coming out in a book called Scorpio in the fall of 2017 or 2018 from uh, University or Miami University Press. It's a university press based out of Ohio. Yeah, yeah. That's about, uh, sure. to be honest, that's only about 20 yeah. minutes from where I live right now. So no, I know exactly yeah, what you're talking so, about. Uh, so that's, that's how I started doing it. You know, it was, and it was weird for me because I, when I started writing again all the time, I all of a sudden I realized after maybe two, three years, I said, you know, I'm, I want to be a poet. And I didn't know what to do. So I went to the only poet that I knew in Washington, D.C., which is where I was at the time. His name is Rod Smith. And he works at a really wonderful bookstore called Bridge Street Books. Oh, I have been in there. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah, it's a great, a great bookstore. Yeah, and, uh, it totally I went, is. So I went, and it's wonderful, and I, and I went in there and I said, Rod, can I send you some poems? And I said, I want to be a poet, but I don't know how to do it. And he, he just looked at me, and said, Go to some readings. Eventually, someone will ask you to read. <laughs> it was that's so pretty. It's you know, pretty easy. Yeah, super <laughs> dead fan. And, you know, and I listened to him and I started going to readings and, you know, it changed my life. And God sort of helped me get off the ground with everything in terms of poetry and, not, you know, look at it. Yeah, I have my third book coming out in the fall. So so you didn't grow up like being a fan of poetry, it sounds like. You just sort of discovered it, you know, as you were coming of age then? Well, I remember my first book of poetry that I really read and and by myself, you know, sometimes you got to read something by yourself and just whatever. It was Maya Angelou. And it was these poems. She had a, a poem called The Thirteens, parentheses white. You turn the page and it's The Thirteens, parentheses black. And it's two versions of being 13 years old. But your life is like real crazy, right? She just killed me. And the, it, the way the language turns and it's just these bits and pieces. And all of a sudden you're like, you can see this. It's all, like you can see a whole novel in just these little lines of poetry. It's unbelievable. But I was, so I wasn't a voracious poetry reader. I loved it, but I was more of a voracious, I was really a reader of young adult literature, like <laughs> novels. I was so into it. Historical fiction, 
all kinds of, I just, just anything I could get my hands on fantasy, science fiction. I just really loved it. And I, 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 I think I read every book in the school library, actually. I had to expand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was right there with you, man. Yeah. I, yeah, I was in a library a lot think, when I was a kid, too. Yeah, and that's what I mean, I think, when I say one of one of the great gifts my family gave me. Uh, my father was a huge reader, huge point of pride for him. He has many, many books. So they gave me that, for sure, many things in that. Yeah, and you know, poetry is something I don't think a lot of people appreciate these days, or maybe they do, and I just don't know any of these people. But And you know, maybe that has to do with being force-fed certain types of poetry or certain poets in our schooling, you know, like, who the fuck wants to read Shakespeare when you're 13, right? Yeah, I well, I remember viciously fighting, you know, particularly in France, like, we were supposed to know, like, we were getting these these lectures, there was a lot more poetry in the French education system than in America. But I also, I remember fighting in America, but particularly in France, like I got in a loud vocal argument with the teacher because and I think we even called them professor, but she said, this is what the poem means. And I said, how can you tell me what it means? That's not what it means to me. And she said, this is what he was meant to say. I'm like, you don't know that. She said, well, given historical context, this, you, I'm like, you don't know what he meant to say. And it doesn't matter. You know, it's what it means to the reader, I think. And I really believe that, like, you know, as a writer, you can design something as far as you can design it. You know, you write it, you frame it, you work to, you know, like the Trinity Star Trinity, that poem has a very very deeply spiritual dimension and so it's very helpful to have it published with scarlet imprint in particular because it it leans towards an audience which is open towards the spiritual and it tells the audience right away hey this is spiritual prepares them you know and you can do that kind of framing but at the end of the day the poem is whatever the reader takes from it it's whatever it means to them it's theirs once it once it goes into them, it's theirs. And I think, you know, we don't try to tell people what musical lyrics mean. We just listen to it and love it, you know. And I think that's part of the problem with poetry is, you know, we we don't teach people say, hey, read this. What do you love about it? You know, we don't we don't we say, what does the poem mean? <laughs> well, yeah. is that what does the poem mean? It, you know, we don't ask, what does the song mean? We say. Do you like this? Did you want to dance? How did you feel? What you know? Those are the, that's how you read poetry. Did your heart chakra open? What vibration did you feel on your body? You know, like yeah. that, those are the questions to me more. And I think you know, it's like, oh, how did you feel? You know, what 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 experience did you have with this? I got some major beef with people who go online and search for the meanings of song lyrics and then try to shove them in your face. Like, no, dude, this is what it means. It's right here on the internet. <laughs> I'm like, fuck you. No, it's not. That is not what it means. That's not what it means to me. Get that shit out of my face. You know, and and speaking of speaking of beef, you know, something I wanted to hear you rant on, if you don't mind, it's something I know that you've written and spoken about. It's this historical omission of women poets from the poetry canon. You know, the poets that we're all introduced to in our youth are typically men. You know, names like Walt Whitman, William Carlos Williams, Robert Frost, Ezra Pound. Although, full disclosure, I thought Ezra Pound was a woman at first because of the first name. Um, (laughs) So, my bad. Uh, But regardless, you know, what do you make of this omission? You know, were women poets not as prolific or as talented? Or was it because the men were the ones creating the canon itself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I have a godmother, my mother's best friend from when she was growing up. And interestingly enough, she led a whole life. Her husband, very unfortunately, died young. And um, she took over his business and, you know, did a lot of things that were very impressive for women. And then went back to school and got a PhD in English literature. And what she studies is women's literature in the Italian Renaissance. Well, You'd think, like, oh, there were no women writers in the Italian Renaissance. Well, actually, there were. They had to publish under pseudonyms. And there's wonderful texts. And when you go back and you look at the, the actual 
evidence, it turns out a lot of these women were the most popular in the salons, in the literary salons. It was like, oh, the men were there, but the women were really the ones who would draw the audience. They were wonderful writers, you know, short story writers, uh, novelists, songwriters, uh, poets, but they weren't allowed to publish. And it was very taboo. They, they were supposed to stay in their husband's house. And, you know, more and more now, this is being documented in academia and through history. And there are, you know, it turns out exhaustive resources. There's, there's in some senses, anyone who thought women's studies was a pointless thing is silly because what put women's studies in some sense birthed was all of these new angles of history and all of this new primary research that's being done, which goes a long way to show us that it, it wasn't that that women writers never really existed before. It's that they weren't allowed to be documented and it wasn't written in the official record. And almost, you know, I, I work with a, a lot of poets to go back through to try to understand, hey, when we look at the Spanish Civil War, who were the great poets? Oh, well, actually, but there's this great woman poet who nobody really talks about. Let's come up with some more evidence and understanding of her work. And I think it's a lot of, you know, I think it's a, a lot of those little stories that because oftentimes men were writing the history that, you know, the women were overlooked or, you know, literally uh, pointedly omitted because it wasn't in the cultural vein. And, you know, that's part of the work that I do with uh, Tender Buttons Press, which is a 25 year old now, let's see, 27, 28 year old publishing press for uh, poets and we publish avant-garde, experimental women writers, many of whom who have gone on to win Guggenheims and are arguably some of the best writers around. We have a saying in the poetry community that, or I should say this, I heard a wonderful poet, uh, Mimi Bersenbrugger, if I'm saying her name correctly. I, I saw her speak when I was quite young. I was actually in college still, and somebody asked her, how do you feel about the women gender issue now? And she said, well, I don't worry. All the best poets are women these days. And it really struck me because I'm not sure that fact is translating to contemporary society or to documentation or is getting out beyond, you know, Mae Mae Burschenberger's opinion or the intimate in-scene poetry crowd, you know? Right. That's what we try to do with Tender Buttons, say, hey, these people exist and, and part of we try to do is, you know, through what, whether you call it marketing or communication or whatever, we're trying to make that part of the official record. Yeah, that was actually a question I wanted to follow up with. And if you already answered it, that's fine. But, you know, obviously the attitude toward women poets today is much different than it was in the 18th and 19th centuries. And I guess we don't even have to restrict that conversation to poets, you know, I mean, just, I guess, women writers in general. But in relation to, to just poetry, I'm wondering what kind of work is being done exactly to fix the issue with the historical canon? So that's a great question. I don't think enough is being done. You know, I've sort of started conversations here and there. I talked to a guy from PBS. I said, what if we did a series on women poets? You know, I I try to put the bug in as many people's ears as I possibly can. Some of the work is being done at the academic level, and some of it's being done inside the poetry community. And I mean, some of this work literally takes place on Facebook, long Facebook threads of conversation. How did, you know, thinking, trying to think through things in a different perspective now, is that work getting into books or getting out into communicated to like a, what you might call the public at large or like more of a, a documentation so that people can, when they think about poetry and their poetry canon, they don't have to, there's a book that they can read that says, hey, it was more than Ezra Pound and, you know, hey, look at Mina Loy or, you know, let's talk about Emily Dickinson or, you know, is that really happening? I, not to my knowledge. Is it coming in the future? I, I, I sure fucking hope so. I'm optimistic. Well, if it's on Facebook, it's official canon now until somebody wipes the servers. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it is in some sense. I was thinking, yeah, I think you're right. I think it helps to have things compiled in a book so that that can be passed around. It also helps to have it taught, to have a book that teaches stuff we... Oh, let's talk to Leanne about it. We'll find somebody who wants to write a history. Maybe that's not a bad idea. Yeah, for sure. 
And I think the same could be said about philosophy and its canon. I don't know how much of a philosophy oh, nerd yeah. you are, but, you know, well, I guess, first of all, poetry and philosophy seem to have an interesting intersection point, which I'd also love to hear your take on. But, you know, just speaking to the philosophy canon right now, you know, all of the uh, yeah. the quote-unquote great philosophers that were all taught seem to be men. I took a, a comparative philosophy course in college and I don't recall one woman being mentioned. Of course, my lack of recollection could be for a host of other reasons, but I do find it hard to believe that there were not any female philosophers worth teaching in that class. But I guess it's probably the same issue that we were talking about with poetry, is that the the men also wrote the philosophy canon, right? Oh, yeah. Don't even get me started. This is why Alain Sisu is so important. Alain Sisu is, to my knowledge, is one of the most influential female philosophers and she has been writing to, I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s. She's wonderful for this reason. There are more female philosophers today that are being known and written and talked about, but I think it's similar to poetry. I think, I think the canon is really appalling. And I think it goes into what is the difference between poetry and philosophy. It, you know, it goes back to Aristotle and Plato, I think, and Sappho, you know, what is the difference between these things? And yes, there's some sort of superficial differences where one is, you know, one, this philosophy is, you know, it's written in these like paragraphs or it's written in sort of like this more quote unquote logical structure. But you you look at Derrida, you look at, you know, works and days by Herodontus, I think, early Greek texts a lot of philosophy is actually quite written quite poetically and it's not written in a straightforward manner. It's written in, you know, sort of like a Borgesian poetry, you know, like a a cipher for people to figure out and, or, you know, look at Plato. He wrote in plays. He, he, he wrote in the the dramaturge, you know, and when I read Sappho or I read Plato's Republic, it's like, there's as much of a, point of view on the perspective of life and as there is in Sappho as there is in Plato. Now, do we have as many texts? Uh, There's less in Sappho, obviously, but that's recorded or saved. But, you know, look, what really is the difference here? And I think in, in some ways, the difference that's been excluded, and, you know, this is a controversial statement, but I think part of what's different is that there were very female forms, traditionally divine feminine forms, like expression, the female expression of Eros or the female expression of lyric, like you see with Sappho. And that is specifically considered not poetry. You see that today with, you know, I have a, a very dear friend, uh, Monica McClure, who I think is a just wonderful, great, great, great poet. And, um, she writes about uh, beauty creams and makeup and, and the, the, the contemporary beauty industry. And these are things that, you know, for whatever reason, they have been this, this aspect of the divine feminine has been excluded. And it's, it's not wrong. These are, these perspectives are, however they come out poetry or more straightforward philosophy type of thing. These are, it's so important things, you know. I'm not sure I answered your question, but that's a <laughs> rambling. I, one thing I would like to say is I have a, another dear friend who used to say when we were talking about the difference between poetry and philosophy. He said, he said, philosophy in the word is when it became male, and before that, all the writers there was no difference between poetry and philosophy, and they were all hermaphrodites. <laughs> and, yeah. and po- like, and I think that's a. I really like that way of looking at it. I think I think that's pretty spot on, actually. You know, if you just allow me to to ramble just for a moment, those questions. Well, those first couple of questions that I set you up with, you know, they may seem like I'm hating on men, and I'm not. I mean, I am one. Well, almost. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> but you know, th- yeah. so th- I'm not trying to set this up as some sort of like historical battle of the sexes. I mean, but this this is history, and it was written by men and written quite poorly, I might add. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how this will come off, but there is something about feminine aspects 
and I'm not talking in like a like a physical sense here, but there is something about feminine aspects that are so damn empowering and sexy. And if you have those aspects integrated properly, you know when you meet someone who has these aspects integrated properly like it's just a different sort of personal experience with these kind of people and i'm not just talking about women here i've met several men who have these feminine aspects properly balanced in their personas and that's sort of what i was getting at when i said i'm not quite a man yet i'm I'm still working on that balance in my own persona and i don't think you can be a man until you fully embrace those feminine aspects of yourself and integrate them into your persona and that's that's probably why these problems with the poetry and philosophy canons exist you have a a bunch of men sort of drunk on men things you know power and greed and lust and whatever else and that's that's obviously reflected in the histories they've written so uh, sorry for that little rant you can take the mic back from me there no not at all and i i think you know i was just saying last night that as the divine so we're experiencing a reawakening of the divine feminine the, the archetype of the feminine and i i think actually it's important that I say this, I don't mean to contradict you because it's a human value to give everyone value and worth, maybe a feminine value, but it is, I think two things. One, the feminine isn't completely innocent, right? (laughs) It's just oppressed. And some of it has some, you know, greed or narcissism or whatever. Some, some qualities are just human, but the divine feminine is rising and it's a wonderful thing because as it rises, I think masculinity will also rise. And I think that's another way of saying what you've been saying is that you can't feel like a whole man until you have experienced these aspects of the divine feminine in yourself. And when we say divine feminine, maybe another way to say that is archetypes of the female, of of the female experience, and maybe the yin and the yang together. And I, I think that that is that was something we just started stumbling upon last night and you're, you're filtering into it perfectly. It's like, and I think it's so important is like, as the feminine rises again, it's not for something for men to be afraid of. It's something for men to rejoice because it will equally bring them, bring them back into themselves. You know, like we, it's, it, this isn't, you know, this is about the removal of a repression of one, you know, so that both can rejoice together, I think. Just even logically thinking about that, you know, if the feminine rises, the masculine has to, so you maintain that balance, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it will. And yeah, yeah, I think absolutely. And there's this beautiful thing going on where I think, you know, so many so many men are just coming up and saying, oh, wow, I see this, you know, that's wonderful how to Sorry, open but... their hearts and speak from their hearts and I just say, I think it's great. I think, you know, it's a painful period that we're going through, but I think it'll lead to good things. It's a, it's a very healthy conversation that needs to be had. So definitely. Yeah. So back to that, that intersection point between poetry and philosophy that I mentioned, and you kind of talked about that briefly, you know, I'm, I'm wondering based on, I mean, I guess if you agree with what your friend said about how they're really no different then the question's already answered, but I'm going to ask it, I'm going to ask it anyways, but do you see poetry as a completely separate mode or discipline or, or language? I'm not sure what the right word is there, but do you see any real distinction between poetry and philosophy? Such a hard question. I've grappled with it for so long. On a kid, you know, in a surface level area, yes, I see very like pointed differences. One tends to take the form of really long text. I think there's like a formal difference, but I think underneath the content, you know, poetry is a more abstract, abstract way of representing a worldview. It can be. It can also be something that is just representing sound or it's representing, it can be representing utter nonsense, right? And in that aspect, I I think that it's a little bit maybe not as related to philosophy, which, you know, tries to do something on the more worldview level. But I do think that one of the things that's important to me to point out to philosophy is that what poetry can contain is the dynamic of the spiritual, or it can contain the dynamic of that which has not been scientifically proven, that which is intuitive, that which is wisdom, that which is gained from maybe communicating with one's gods or communicating with more of like a sacred space. And I think that's what's important for me to put on the table in the conversation between poetry and philosophy is that don't forget 
that this communication with the sacred is an important part of the discourse. And that's something that poetry has really maintained throughout history since, you know, 2000 years since Plato. Philosophy has gone into this much more conventional light, sort of following Freud into the science realm or sort of attempted to do that. And I think I, to me, that's the important distinction that's relevant for that's why the conversation, what is the difference between poetry and philosophy is relevant, because I see that as one of the huge dif- distinctions. So you don't think philosophy can embody those same concepts or can. ideas? Okay. I think it can, absolutely. But I think it could. I think that in contemporary forms, it tends not to. I think, mm. I mean, you know, Derrida was someone who had more of a relationship to that. But, you know, Badia, for example, totally... You know, he he even rejects the concept of oneness. You know, he's like, oh, those poets always talking about intuition. Those stupid poets are talking about <laughs> oneness. And, you know, it's, like, it's yeah. like very angry inside of him. You know, like it, it's a kind of a weird thing. It's like, it's just a, it's a weird thing. Speaking of philosophy, you know, you're also familiar with more occult philosophies, which I really wasn't aware of, you know, when I first started to to research you and your work. But you mentioned it briefly before we started recording here. So I'm, I'm just wondering, what is your familiarity with the occult? Where did you come across these sorts of practices and concepts first? Yeah, <laughs> I was talking to my friend about this today. I said, do you think I should call myself a witch? Do you think I should brand as that? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I my, it's part of it's very intuitive, and part of it is like, part of it goes back to China. You know, the the word logic in China is literally a transliteration of English logi, and it was introduced by the British during the Opium War in like the eighteen sixties, eighty eighteen eighties. So if you can imagine, China's like a 5,000-year-old culture. They, it's unbelievable that they didn't have a word for this thing that we're obsessed with, logic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, logic is actually like the Western Enlightenment or logic is not something that it, it's so ingrained in our society today that we almost can't imagine something not based on that. But it's like the, you know, the Western Enlightenment has to do with the period after who's the guy in like the 1600s who figured out the, uh, I want to say like Galileo, but I don't think it's Galileo. It's the guy who the sun is the center of the universe and the earth goes around You're it. You're talking about uh, anyway, Copernicus. No, is it Copernicus? Anyway. Yeah. It's around the time of Newton and his, and his laws and, and understanding, you know, there's, there were all of a sudden people said, Oh, you can have laws to the universe. Therefore things have order and rationality and they're very logical. And this idea of, it goes into the term like the Western enlightenment. And a lot of writers have written about how false this is to hide our spiritual dimension. Rene Guénon, wonderful writer who actually is championed by Steve Bannon, which is like the weirdest fucking thing I've ever heard. I can't, yeah. don't yeah, see how he's, I don't know what, I'm like, what the fuck? Are you serious? How are you taking <laughs> Rene Guénon and doing that? But okay. You know, I think it's like our understanding of logic and its dominance and the, the scientific method and all these things. I don't think that they're bad things. I, I love mathematics. I, I love math. I have a degree in theoretical or pure mathematics. I love it. It's absolutely gorgeous. But it's not the only thing there is. It's not the only way of knowing. And I learned that I was really open to that when I was in when I was in China because it's very active in the culture as opposed to here where the culture is predominantly like, you know, think of how many science articles we read every day. And so it's like every I, I think this is an aspect of the masculine that I see actually. Well, This is the rational way. This is Mm -hmm. what science says. If it's not this, it has to get out. And, you know, but there are other intuitive ways of knowing that are really relevant. So I became kind of obsessed with trying to understand intuition and trying to understand these other pathways, these other voices, these other ways of knowing. As same as I wanted to understand mathematics, that was a very active part of my study of poetry. And those things in conjunction. I think also my study of science, which was, you know, pretty formidable. That's what got me into astrology because you can't really differentiate at a certain point in history. You can't differentiate astrology from math. Uh, they're, they're almost one and the same. Yeah. How math was born. 
we know it. And that sort of nexus is what led me into, and then, you know, just communications in life, you know, has led me into, you know, knowing people on the occult scene and then thereby being branded by it. And, but I think it's wonderful that, that there are other folks who, who still continue to, to look into these ancient practices and try to understand the world. I try to understand what, what the humans from thousands of years ago knew and understood. I, I don't think we should reject those things at all. And, it, and I think it's fine to reinvent them, but those are forms of wisdom. And, and, and there's occult practices that, that were developed under very similar conditions to what you would call the scientific method. If for nothing else, then people studied them, you know, people used and practiced these wisdoms that came out of the occult for very many thousands of years. So there is, you know, if you believe in, I don't want to say if you believe in, but there's in a sense like an evolutionary force that, you know, people don't do things unless it works, <laughs> you know? Right, um, yeah. You know, I think there's sort of like a, a prejudice against people from the past. Like, oh, they're dumb, they're done. Those ancients were stupid. They didn't have our computers, you know. Well, they were pretty smart and active and bright people. They didn't so. have to Google the meaning of song lyrics, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they did it. They might gossip. What did you think this meant? <laughs> you know? So I'm curious then, you know, would you consider your poetry to be occult poetry? I mean, like Trinity Star Trinity, which we'll get into in a minute is, you know, it's very spiritual. It, it's sort of rooted in Greek mythology. And then, you know, you're talking about your interest in, in astrology and, you know, maybe things like magic or witchcraft. So I'm just curious. Oh, and then you mentioned your upcoming book too called Scorpio. Obviously that is rooted in yeah. the Zodiac. So would you consider yourself yeah. an, an occult poet maybe? I. I'm not afraid of that word, and anybody who wants to call me that is more than welcome. I think just in terms of my own personal lexicon or language, I think Trinity Star Trinity would fit under that category more than maybe Scorpio. Trinity Star Trinity is really, really trying to understand or recreate an ancient perspective or touch something ancient. It's also really working with the ode or the chant. It's, I mean, it, it is literally almost like a chant, like that word, Trinity, Star Trinity, those three words come up over and over and over again. And the incantation, it's an incantation. It's almost like drum beats. And I was trying to do that. I was like, where is this old, what, this old ode, this chant, we've done something with, it's, it's been there for so long, but we don't touch it in contemporary poetry because everyone's obsessed with like the new form or I'm going to, I'm going to invent this or I'm going to invent that. I'm going to be the avant-garde. Well, maybe it's avant-garde to reclaim the ancient. So that's one thing in terms of form, but there's a lot of thought that went into that beforehand. And then I think that thought comes out when in editing or even in the creation, when the, the creation is very channeled, you know, um, and that's the word I use for a channel. Like it, it, it comes in the space. And it comes and you, you might not know what it means yet. It just comes and you just trust that you're writing down what you need to be writing mm -hmm. down. Yeah. And you trust, that's what it is, I think, to follow intuition is you, you don't maybe have a rational explanation for why yet. You're just following this impulse of what, why, like, what am I supposed to do now? Now you have to do that judiciously. It's not like, oh, I need to go into this bar and you just, it's not rage, you know, it's, <laughs> It's, I think, like letting, letting strong desires come up and letting yourself go there, even if it doesn't necessarily fit in the matrix or you don't, can't explain it via the matrix that you have at hand. So if that part is true, then, then Scorpio also very much fits under that. I, I wrote a lot of those poems. They, I wrote them blind. I mean, they almost, they would come to me in a fit of tears. They would come to me at almost... I would get real anxious and I wouldn't so I'd be able to stop walking around and all of a sudden I would sit down and just, just write this thing. I have no idea. It just pours out of you, you know? So if that part of the process is a cult, then sure. Although I would say that I think there are a lot of contemporary writers who write like that. There's a, a great deal of poets who are working today who maybe wouldn't be called a cult or wouldn't think to call themselves that they are writing that way. I get the sense that's been true through history. There's some Robert Graves wrote a lot about this in The White Goddess. I think there's a lot of, really a decent bit of evidence that that's just how poets sort of function. I think that is one thing that makes 
you didn't ask me this, but I think that's one thing that makes poetry. I don't want to say that it's different from painting because I, I don't, I, I'm sure maybe that's just something about art. I think in general that it, it's connected to sort of an, a singular vision or a, like a channeling or something. No, I would but, agree with you. I think all good art works on that intuitive level. Like, I don't know if I want to call it channeling for everybody, but yeah, you are certainly drawing from some other source, right? That's just sort of not yourself. You know, I've had several ideas, for example. I like to start stories and not finish them. So I would have several ideas that I would write down and then I'd write a little bit about them. And then, you know, maybe a year or two later, I'd see like a new novel or like a new movie that comes out. And it's like similar to what I was jotting notes about. So, you know, those ideas are in the ether maybe perhaps. But, you know, one more quick question before we get into Trinity Star Trinity. But I am curious that, you know, you said you studied math and that seems like it would have a practical application when it comes to writing poetry, does it? I think that I tend to give things a lot of structure, formal structure. And, you know, math is sort of like a visual geometry. If philosophy is rhetoric... Math is, it's sort of like the painting, <laughs> you know, or like, it's like the, the visual art. It's the visual art of logic. And I think I tend to give, I think I, I tend to give my poems, you know, the Trinity Star Trinity has this like mathematical thing. It's like, you know, it's three cubed, 27 poems, 27 words each, three times three times three is 27. You know, it's a lot of structure to it. Scorpio does is more like a traditional poem poem, doesn't have a lot of structure to it. Or this like sort of like grand like container that's, you know, sort of Ulipian in a way. But yeah, I mean, I think I've always said that beyond math is poetry. And I think what I mean by that is, you know, maybe there's three ways to say that. Beyond math is poetry. Like beyond what poetry is what is beyond logic. Poetry is maybe what is in that intuitive space that is sort of beyond the rational or beyond what you can reaction, rationally articulate. And it, maybe that is part that maybe that space is part of the divine feminine. If the rational is sort of like traditionally male, I'm not sure how I feel about that last bit, like pairing them because I don't want to give, I don't want to like give credence to the idea that like, you know, the man holds the rational and the woman is completely irrational. Like, I I don't know if I love that, but, you know, hopefully that's changing. But I think that is one way that things have been understood. So, uh, Well, I don't think it's necessarily man and woman, but I think it is masculine and feminine. I think the intuition is very feminine, obviously. So the opposite of that, you know, logic and rationale, I mean, that would be masculine just by its very definition. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that it is, like, you know, it's for the archetypes. So to, to bring back this problem of the historical canon and sort of tie it into your book, Trinity Star Trinity, you know, some of that problem, I think, we may be able to trace back to Greek mythology and the story of the goddess Hera, whom your book is thematically tied to and also dedicated to, I think. So... For the listeners who are unaware, you know, could you give us the sort of uh, Bohent's notes on on Hera and and her story and, you know, how it relates to what we've been discussing here and how it ties into your book? Yeah, totally. So Hera, she is in a symbolic way, I mean, in a personal way, like I had when I was writing that poem, I had a very personal experience with her. I went out to her, what was her, her Parthenon, it was what the edifice the remains of the edifice. It was 14 times larger than the the edifice in Greece in Athens, which is for Zeus. It was huge. And Hera was the earth goddess. There were there were many, many, many earth moon goddesses that were around really up until Greek times. And symbolically, I identify Hera at, at once. It was like democracy. You know, Zeus came to the. There were nine gods who came to the table and sat with Hera. And then Zeus later dethroned her, and he became the head of the table. And that process, to me, was the beginning of the repression of the divine feminine. And so to me, symbolically, Hera represents like the last of the line of, you know, the female, the ruling female deities, which I think was incredibly common until that sort of touch point in history. And so it was, that's part of what Trinity Star Trinity is, it's like, Let's go back 
let's go back to the divine feminine. Let us remember what it is and to try to write something that invokes the divine through that ode, that chant, it invokes it. It literally almost like, I mean, it's almost a spell. It's almost, it's like, here's an incantation, say this out loud, say it in a group, say it over candles, say it over incense, say it out loud and, and let this feeling rise. There's a, a light in it. So, and that light is part of what I experienced, you know, when I was communing with Hera, a beautiful light. She has just a wonderful, just a wonderful, wonderful essence. The greatest calm you ever felt in your life. <laughs> oh my God, this is possible. This is such a gift. You know, you mentioned Sappho earlier too, and I know that the the poem you wrote is not really connected to her, but Sappho does have an interesting history too, and she is connected to Hera and poetry. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about her too. Well, Sappho is just, I mean, I I just adore Sappho and I admire her. And, and you know, it's really funny. I was, in, I was on the Isle of Lesbos where Sappho was born and we lost our keys and we had to go in, keys to the car, and we had to go and try to find somebody. We ran into this guy and he said, we, we found, I know an archaeologist, we found Sappho's grave and I just started stuttering. I said, you, Sappho? And I was embarrassed to say that I was a, he said, well, why do you care so much? I said, well, I'm, I'm a, a poet. I mean, not like Sappho, but I'm a poet. <laughs> it was, yeah, that's how I feel. I feel like, how can I even call myself a poet next to Sappho? I mean, she's so genius, you know? It's just like, this stuff just drifts off of her, and that's just so luscious. And I and I love her. You know, I think she gets named as a lesbian a lot, but I, I think she was... I, that's fine that she had lesbianic tendencies, but I, I think she's just more fundamentally about desire and, you know, desire, just desire in general. Like what, it, and, and I think, you know, historically they, she ran a, a, a women's finishing school. I'm not sure that she was so specifically lesbian so much as she was just expressing the just desire. And that's what she was around, or at least that's my, my reading of it. But her writing, just the, just the lyric, the tonality, like, it's just so good. It's so good. So, I don't know. They're, they're sort of like perfect forms in the world. And I think Sappho is one of them, in my opinion. <laughs> so, if you had to look at the poem that is Trinity Star Trinity as a reader, not as yeah. the person who wrote it, but if you looked at that from a reader's perspective, what would you say that's about? Gosh, well, I do think about that. I would say that it's about, just in like a sort of like a, like a summary perspective, like, you know, I think there's sort of three parts of it. It's like, it's almost like, okay, so she goes into this sort of like sexual entrance, right? But, you know, there's like Trinity Star Trinity. There's the expression of love, of making love, of sexuality. Then I think that there is, in the middle part, there's like uh, a going into darkness. And then I think in the, the third part, there's a, re, a rising back up. And the rising back up is about looking at the, the, the darkness of the earth and the sin and the injustice and you know, maybe the oppression of the divine feminine. And then, but coming back out and saying, hey, look, you know, like just very simply that like, we're alive. And I feel gratitude and like, I just like that, like, that's it. They're simple. Like I am alive, you know, and um, to try to express some of these, these principles of, you know, theology or like, you know, what you feel. And if you go into a, a place of worship, everyone knows you, you walk into a church, you haven't been there before and you feel something. It's like, whoa, <laughs> this is, you know, and some, some, I was like, I went to a, Spanish church on the Indian reservation in Taos and that place felt very sad. That's not their place of worship, you know, that's in in position. But, you know, I think there's, you know, but different places have different vibes and one of the things they have in common is gratitude. Just awe, you know, what the fuck? We're alive. (laughs) That's the craziest thing. That's really crazy. So, if you really think about it, being alive is such a fucking weird thing. I mean, if you really just kind of, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you just kind of sit back and you're like, I am, I am conscious, I am aware of like myself and my body and my own thoughts, and like, how fucking weird is that? Totally, totally, yeah. And I think it's also about the humility 
to think, you know, you, somehow you were put here. We didn't put ourselves here. So there is something bigger than us. I think that that's also a humility that's in Trinity Star Trinity. I think that concept of, you know, there's all, that humility is part of finding the joy and awe in, in sentience. Yeah, that was actually my note about your poem was I, to me, like if I had to pick out what I thought it was about, I yeah. wrote, you know, sort of a rediscovery of the spirit. I, I don't know why I, I got that impression from it, but that's, that's just, that's my four words that I wrote oh, about yeah. it. Oh, take that. I think that's well said. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah, great. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Katie, I think that's a good note to wrap up on here then. I, I did have a question here. If you had any upcoming events in the U.S. that people could be on the lookout for. There's bound to be things coming up in New York, and you can come to my website. You mentioned uh, your website. That's katiebohens.com. Is there any place else on the internet that people can keep up with you and your work? You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Try to post my readings on there. Not as good at Twitter. We'll link your social profiles uh, in the show notes to this episode. And, cool. of course, we mentioned up front the book is available now through Scarlet Imprint. Yes. We'll link that as well. Yes, definitely check that out. They did such a good job with the design. It's really gorgeous. They're just, I'm so pleased with that book in every way. It's really magical, and they're just the right press, and it's wonderful. So it's been a wonderful experience to work with Alkistis and Peter. They're just, they're magical, too. I have a lot of awe and hold them in very high esteem. Absolutely. They are great people, great resources, too. I mean, you know, just impressive people to, to hear speak and and to to read their stuff and to see their their physical art form that is the book now you know i i love that they focus on that presentation aspect of it because that's sort of a lost art oh it's amazing they do such a good job at it it's so great it's like oh they just they make things beautiful and you know beauty is almost a underrated art it's, it's a wonderful thing so celebrating being alive <laughs> Definitely, definitely. So, Katie Bohens, thank you so much for taking the time here. I really do appreciate it. Good luck with the book, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Thanks so much, Ryan. No problem. Take care. <laughs> and there she is, Miss Katie Bohens. My thanks again to her, and my thanks to all of you for sticking with it, and my apologies again for the audio and some spots there. I did have to cut out a few minutes because the connection made Katie's words really hard to understand at times, but all in all, again, I think she got the message across. And speaking of messages, this is the end of a nice thematic thread that started back in episode 68 where we had a bunch of dudes talking a bit about the feminine, and the last three episodes have, I think, shown that in action. Francesca Seiden in episode 69 talking about sexual alchemy and embracing that part of the human experience. Susie Chang and Mel Moline in episode 70 using their esoteric intuition to journey through the arcane archetypes and mysteries of the tarot. And Katie Bohens here dancing with the rediscovery of the feminine spirit through her lyrical stylings. So be sure to check out those episodes and all of their respective work. Links are in the show notes of this episode to Katie's work specifically, to her website, and to her book over at Scarlet Imprint. As for my work, I just started a new series of episodes for $5 plus patrons over on my Patreon page. It's called Oculture Raw. It's a stripped down version of this show, more spontaneous, less structure, unedited, unscripted, and unprepared conversations with new guests, former guests, friends, and foes alike. The first episode was posted late Saturday night, just minutes after I got off a call with Ian Wilson, who was a guest here in episode 43. Ian has been lucid dreaming for 31 years and was literally on vacation in Virginia visiting the famous Monroe Institute, where a lot of human consciousness research has taken place, you know, OBEs, remote viewing, things of that nature, a lot of military involvement there in years past. Ian was flying back home Sunday morning and wanted to chat about having an ultra-rare lucid precognitive dream, literally a lucid dream that ended up coming to fruition in the waking world, and that happened on his trip, so he wanted to chat about that while it was still fresh. So we talked about that, talked about the Monroe Institute and all that associated stuff with it. I had no notes, no preparation, and I thought it turned out all right. So more of that kind of stuff on the way for patrons. Now hop on that train while it's still gaining steam patreon.com slash oculture. 
I did restructure some of the rewards there too, so if you were on the fence before, take another look at it. The $5 a month level is the one I'd recommend. That'll get you all the raw episodes as they're posted. And speaking of Patreon, a shout out to our newest patron, Matt, who jumped in at the $10 level, so he's now listed as an official executive producer of the show. Thanks for your support, Matt. Much love to you. And much love to all of you out there as well, whether you support with a dollar or a download. You're all beautiful, and I can't wait to fill your ear holes with even more esoteric vibrations. But that's enough jibba-jabba from me. I gotta get out of here. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. The moon's intuition breathes late August blue moon drunk with love for Hera. I have known other types of ecstasy, but none as pure as heroin, none as pure as Trinity, star, Trinity. Give with abandon, feel only adoration. The more I sense your energy, the higher it multiplies. Love is the source to infinity, three. Here, now. God, the belief in infinity, damnation of totality. Trinity, star, trinity, I believe in infinity. I believe we are one. Trinity, star, trinity. Whew, that was perfect and gave me a bit of a chill. I'm not going to lie. So <laughs> that's they see it works. It works. Yeah, that's some that's some fucking potent magic right there for real. There you go. <laughs> I got, when we read it at, at Treadwells. Mm-hmm. Holy fuck. Like yeah. I knew I had a feeling I was like I know that aesthetically this poem is meant to be experienced as read three times in a row. I thought maybe Hera would come. Oh, she fucking came. Like, people were, like, crying. Like, afterwards, they were just like, oh, my God, I've never experienced anything like that. I mean, it was it was really intense. It, it was – I didn't know, and it, it wildly exceeded expectations. I'm going to make a really crass joke here, but I, I might have came during that, too. Yeah, that, that was <laughs> – that was I got lost in in there, and I I mean it was a good kind of lost, but yeah, that was really powerful. Thank you for doing that. Seriously, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> that's terrible. You know, I, I might leave. To give just... anybody an orgasm, especially like you know, that's how I always say. That's when you know it's really good literature is when you like really you know you're like oh shit I almost came from that you know. <laughs> I'm you know what fuck it I'm gonna leave this part in as like a nice little outtake because this is if you don't mind if you don't mind. Fair enough. Fair All right, enough. cool. Cool, yeah. We will end the episode like this. With I, pro- I promise I won't me to you as long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait. I don't want to get in. I, I don't want to get labeled as You anything. just have to put that part in, too. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Please rewind this cassette.